you've searched me out and known me, you know my down sitting and my uprising, you understand my thoughts long before I do. You are about my path, my bed, you're acquainted with all my ways. In fact, there is not a word on my tongue, but you, Lord, know it all together. For you have been behind me and in front and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful and excellent for me, I cannot attain to it. Where then may I go from your spirit? Or where shall I go from your presence? If I climb into heaven, you are there. If I go down to Sheol, thou art there also. If I take the wings of the morning and remain in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand hold me. If I say perchance darkness will cover me, then shall my night be turned to day. Yes, the darkness is not dark with you. Night is as clear as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. I will give thanks unto you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and I know it well. <laughs> the kind of knowing that the psalmist is talking about is not data, but relational. And that's what really this is about. It's about our relationships with each other. It's about Bob's relationship with us and with God. And each one of you, if I went around here right now, could come up with half a dozen words to describe the uniqueness of this gift to all of us. And so the reason we've gathered out here today is to inter his ashes, but to recognize that whether he makes his bed here or elsewhere, God surrounds him and cares for him. And we are sustained by creation itself. And that's something that we can take courage in. Let us pray. Lord, you are a light and our salvation. And so we pray that you remember your servant, Father, Lord, according to the favor that you bear in your feet. And grant that increasingly you know that you are the least in this world. In a life of perfect service in your feet. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, and Jesus and Jesus will be in the Holy Ghost forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Unto Almighty God, we commend the soul of our brother departed. We commit his body to the ground, both the earth ashes to ashes, dust to dust. In the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, to our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose coming and glorious majesty, the earth and sea shall give up their good. The corruptible bodies of those that sleep in him will be changed and made like unto his own glories, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. The Lord bless him and keep him. The Lord make his face shine on him and be gracious to him. The Lord look upon him with favor and give him peace. It's a, a somewhat daunting thing to stand in a pulpit and, and seek to say something about Bob Johnson. Uh, he delivered weekly sermons for over 50 years from pulpits at the Riverside Church in Harlem to King's College at Cambridge to Harvard to UNC to Cornell. We felt the best way to honor his generous spirit, his keen mind, and hopeful vision of the world was through his own words. As was so often the case during his lifetime, Bob Johnson's legacy speaks through generations through the voices and endeavors of his children and his grandchildren and now of his great-grandchildren. We will now read some small excerpts from his sermons. This is an excerpt from a, a sermon called Reading Life Through Prayer about the division between faith and activism. There is in each of us a tension between restless activism and faithful acceptance, between change and resignation. It is reflected in St. Teresa's words that we must pray as if all depended on God and work as if all depended on us. It is also in T.S. Eliot's Ash Wednesday prayer, teach us to care and not to care. Our peace is your will. This is a difficult spiritual balancing act, a tension not only for church folk, but for all who know the full range of human possibilities. As Kenny Rogers sings, you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them, when to resign yourself and when to keep fighting. It is shot through life. 
It is the critical choice in our work, in our marriages, and in our faiths, whether or not we realistically assess the possibilities. The world begs to be set right. I often pray the great prayer of Cardinal Newman at funerals and memorial services. Support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and our work is done. But that's where I have trouble. When is our work ever done? When can we finally let go? Believe me, when I move to North Carolina, I look forward to letting go of mowing, of raking leaves and hauling firewood, of cooking and cleaning and fretting over two boys finding their way through adolescence. But can we ever let go of claims for a greater justice, for true peace among diverse neighbors, for understanding in this complex, wondrous world? Can we ever get out from under the need to change? to grow, to expand our horizon. Reinhold Niebuhr never could. As his friend, the poet W.H. Auden wrote, the choice to love is open until we die. Reinhold Niebuhr was a uh, dad's teacher at Union. Nothing worth doing can be achieved in a lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing that is true or beautiful or good it makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing that we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we are saved by law. Nothing virtuous is quite as virtuous from the standpoint of our friend or foe as from our standpoint. And therefore, we must be saved by the final form of love, which is forgiveness. What I wanted to share about was uh, Dad's sermon by other church, which uh, is about the North Carolina Museum of Art and, and the sol solace and wisdom and beauty he found there. And uh, I know from the gift of art, knowledge, appreciation uh, was given to all us sons by my father. Um, we, uh, he'd always take us to the museums when we traveled. He took us to Europe. It was always a part of who we were as a family, something we did together. And the sermon is, uh, I think, uh, I don't know. Uh, he, he, uh, I think the church of art where dad was as meaningful and truthful as Christianity was. It was part of, part of who he was. And I am uh, so appreciative of what he gave all of us, that, that passion. One of Grandpa Bob's, since we love, beloved, we called him youngest grandchildren, although I, that title has now been taken by some other lovely faces. Um, I, I don't have the wealth and treasure trove of vivid concrete memories that many of you uh, have, but I, that is not to say that he hasn't been incredibly impactful in my life. And, uh, and this memory is in his own words, because I don't remember much about 2004 besides the Red Sox winning their first title. <laughs> but according to him, on Wednesday night, I received a call from my five-year-old grandson, William, in Boston. He had been to church with his parents, and though he'd spent most of the time under the pew, he managed to take in what the preacher was saying about Advent. So he fired at me, Grandpa, why can God bring the baby Jesus through a miracle, but he can't stop the wars where so many people are hurt and dying? Um, which is a lovely conversation to start with your grandfather <laughs> the, the day before Christmas or the week before Christmas. And, to that, he responded, well, out of the mouth, mouths of babes comes such disturbing wisdom. Um, his immediate thought was to tell me to go over to Natick and talk to Rabbi Kushner, uh, who wrote a very cogent book on the death of his young son, why bad things happen to good people. Um, he also talked to me about free will and how bad things happen to good folk in the Bible, just like in regular life. 
Um, but in the end, he, he told me, these are long-standing questions for us humans, uh, and you are right to raise them, and I hope we can talk more about them. Uh, and m many of us would all wish for one more and many more conversations, but we have such a wealth of texts and of knowledge and of many ways of appreciating this world that he has left in all of our hearts, and there are many ways to keep those conversations going. I'm going to read um, an excerpt from a sermon on heaven that he wrote. The third part of Jesus' teaching about heaven is in the parable of the Last Judgment, which tells us that God's grace is open to those who have reached out to the stranger, clothed the naked, fed the hungry. In other words, basic compassion is the key to heaven, not following some narrow doctrine. All of these core teachings reinforce Jesus' first statement, namely, repent, the rule of God is at hand, here and now. We are called to open our lives to this present reality, this deeper dimension. Heaven is not up there. It's in here. Now, some will ask, what about the afterlife? The central creeds hold to this faith, and I still affirm this faith. It need not contradict good science. The universe does conserve energy even as it changes form. And death remains a mystery. What I do know is that the kingdom that Jesus proclaimed, it is real. It is eternal. I'll trust God in whatever comes. But then I move on to John 14 which is in sharp contrast to Jesus's view of heaven. Now, John writes a century after Jesus's death, and he presumes to speak for Jesus through the early church. All those statements of, I am the vine, the way, the truth, and the light. That's John speaking for Jesus. And alas, he does buy into the Ptolemaic view of a three-story universe. Heaven is a palace with many mansions, namely the old heaven. And then, we come to that incredible text that closes out the Bible, the Revelation of St. John. It can be seen as a visionary imagining of the future for Christians. St. John sees a city of God, a city in which there are no temples, following it up with these words. And then I saw heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and a new Jerusalem is coming to be. And a loud voice says, behold, the dwelling of God is within us all. God will dwell here and we will be his people. Could it be any sharper? St. John draws a line between the reign of God's grace in Christ and the old visions of heaven. The old visions of heaven have passed away. Mr. Sagan would concur. The pearly gates and the streets of gold, the yellow Cadillacs and 72 virgins, they are gone. <laughs> The choice before the church today is whether to believe Jesus, that the reign of God is here and now, that the dwelling place of God is within us, namely within this human embodied existence, and that it shines gloriously whenever we show compassion and struggle for righteousness and own up to our own poverty of spirit so that the grace of God can get into those empty spaces. I hope that these words have provoked you enough to go back to the Gospels especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Note the immediacy of the gospel. The time is at hand. The reign of God is within you. The old heaven and the old earth have passed away. For the final excerpt, uh, I'd like to draw on one of his sermons in newness of life and you will hear many themes of his, his favorite themes woven together, painting, science, politics, and the Book of Common Prayer. Western painting goes back to Giotto, who saw the human form, uh, the human figure with new sight and perspective. Monet and the Impressionists broke new ground by going outdoors to paint and gave us new vision of light on haystacks and cathedrals and water. And Picasso plumbed the infinite complexities of humans, their lust, their deceit, and their cruelty. 
And the genius of science goes in the same direction, the capacity to see anew, to move beyond the old formula and paradigms. Copernicus and Galileo and Newton, Einstein and Hawking dared in their moments to see life anew. And like so many artists and saints, they suffered rejection because they saw beyond the conventional wisdom. And what is true for artists and scientists is true for political leaders. Note I say leaders, not followers of the herd. In the crisis of the Civil War, Lincoln called upon our citizens to think anew and act anew. And in the myriad crises before us, uh, even today, we are called to new vision, full of daring and risk to, gas to grasp the new. In my parish church in Burlington, I am rediscovering the richness of the Book of Common Prayer and finding myself especially drawn to the prayer of confession in Rite One of the Eucharist. It concludes like this. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life. In newness of life. That is how the God revealed in Christ is served by leaning in expectation and hope into the new moment and finding there an opening into new possibilities. Not resting on the tired slogans of the past, assumed formula and paradigms, not resting in the conventional orthodoxies, but leaning forward in the faith that God's grace and wisdom will lead us there. It's like old Abraham going out, not knowing where he's going, but seeking a city with eternal foundations. Such a posture is risky, but I've said before, the opposite of faith is not doubt, it is certainty. This is the choice ever before us to endure the burden of time, which creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable, syllable of recorded time. Or to see in every moment, on the brink of the future, in the depth of time, this is where God meets us. This is where we find news of life. A reading from the Gospel of John. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd, and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf scatters and snatches them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. And I must bring them also so that they will listen to my voice. And so there may be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down and to take it again. I have received this command from my Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, I could frankly have sat there for another 30 minutes and listened to those excerpts. The richness in them is almost so much that it takes some time to, to capture it. Bob was a really good friend and really in a lot of ways a mentor for me. And so I'm very thankful to the family for providing this time together and to bring our recollections and our memories with us and fitting them into a larger, larger context. At the opening of convention of the graduate school that I attended, the dean led the community in worship. And I remember, I don't remember anything that he said in his homily, but I remember everything that he said in the first prayer that he offered. In the first collect, he simply stated, O eternal God, you are so mysterious and far above us that we can never fully comprehend you. 
Yet in your Son, Jesus Christ, you've chosen to be so deeply among us, we cannot escape you. And there, in a sense, is the kind of tension of life. The questions, the struggles, the things that we run up against, the boundaries that we don't quite understand, on the one hand. And on the other hand, is a love so potent and intertwining with us that our hope is that even death cannot overcome it. And that's where we sit, I think, today. Let me ask you for a minute to use your imagination. And I think Bob would appreciate this. By the way, he and I had a great conversation one time about the meaning of death and the flatness of life. I happened to be trying to learn the lead guitar part to uh, uh, something called Comfortably Numb. It's by one of my favorite groups, and, uh, and Pink Floyd. And it gave us an opportunity to look at how culture and faith interact with each other in some fairly unusual ways. But I want to ask you for a minute to use your imagination. What I'd like for you to do is let us together visualize something that's a bit of a road map. So you think about a crystal sphere. Looks a little bit like this. And it has facets and it has cuts and it disperses light. And if you catch it just right, it also breaks the light prismatically into its constituent parts. And what I would like for us to do for a moment or two is to think about that crystal sphere being placed inside a second, a much larger sphere with infinite facets more than you and I can take in. And in the beauty of light and color that transforms everything in its reach. And now take one more step and place that small crystal sphere inside the other one. So that its light and beauty are simply magnified by the greater sphere. What I'm suggesting in this visual that Bob Johnson, with all of his assets and deficits, is that smaller sphere. And his life, his life, is now magnified in God, who is that greater sphere. For Bob, the faith he professed and lived was the defining lens through which he looked at all of life. And his faith and I think this is what's most important or was most powerful for me. His faith was not one of restrictiveness, but faith caused him to expand out into everything. Like St. Thomas Aquinas reminds us, all knowledge is a gift from God to be explored and to be cherished. There was not a narrowness of soul the broadening of soul. And for a few moments, let's consider those gifts as God's grace present in this moment and in our engagement in time with Bob. If I simply say, Bob Johnson Sr., what comes to your mind? What's the first thing that pops in? A distinct voice? I never could get that gravelly. It was wonderful to hear when he preached. Both audibly and in terms of insight, distinctive, gracious, patient, receptive, always looking for connections and a deep desire for justice. And I think one of the things that made him lovable for me was a boundless inquisitiveness matched with an ability to explain what he saw, but also to continue to learn. He never quit. Incredible intellect and wit. If memory serves correctly, we first met following the worship service here on this campus late one winter Sunday afternoon. The text had been from Genesis, one of the creation narratives. And I had simply mentioned that it was neither a book of science but a book of theology, and I made reference to my other mentor, John Polkinghorne, the great Anglican priest 
and physicist. And afterwards I saw this man with thick glasses hanging around the chapel until everyone had left. Bob came up and said, did you know John Polkinghorne? Oh yeah. His influence on faith and science actually kept me in the faith at a time when I was about ready to jettison all. And that started years of wonderful conversation. That one little spark, his ability to see commonality rather than what divides, was a part of a gift and the creativity that God grants to us. He loved what tension and vigor could bring into being. And it's amusing that one of his colleagues said, when I asked my four-year-old grandson what he thought God looked like, he immediately said he looks like Bob Johnson. <laughs> Bob would demure and so should we. But that he was a conduit for God's energy, wisdom, and grace, there is no doubt. Goodness, beauty, and love. After 20 years at Cornell, he left a distinctive mark. But let's be honest today and say that he also knew the struggles of life and the effects of aging. The diminishment of his sight was something that aggravated him. Didn't stop him from driving. <laughs> and following the hematoma, his balance and equilibrium got thrown off in a way that he had never quite experienced. He said it's important to us because it gives us a sense that things are fixed and dependable. And there was a difference that permeated his life. We should not ignore the reality that St. Paul points us to in Romans, which is that death and dying haunts all of us at some place in our psyche. And how we come to terms with it determines how we live out our existence. We celebrate joys and strengths, but what do we say to our finitude? Well, death is physical, but it's also, as Bob helped me see, what robs you of real life. He called it the flattening of experience. It's what occurs when we do not believe any longer that we matter, or that love is superior to all other things. That second great crystal sphere in which we take that and place it is the faithfulness of the God to whom we belong. When John has Jesus say, I am the good shepherd, I know my own, and I lay down my life for my own, what is it? Isn't it really a promise that God will withhold nothing from us and standing with or around us whatever transpires? Isn't it the promise that God is more for us than we can be for ourselves or even maybe against ourselves? This is the God who loves us so deeply that we cannot escape. In his wonderful novel, Pillars of the Earth, Ken Follett tells the story of the building of a great medieval cathedral. The cathedral is built over a period of a century, and it's magnificent. It has warmth and coolness, beauty and strength, silence and speaking, human traits. But a tragedy occurs one morning, the roof catches fire, and it burns up the line, and it causes the pillars to collapse and the loss of life. When you first read the the novel, you think the title, Pillars of the Earth, is about these pillars that hold the cathedral up. But in fact, the pillars of the earth are the people. The people who through their trust in God manage not to create their own balance and control, but find hope and security amidst the changes and chances of life. And that's what makes them extraordinary. That's what makes them pillars of the earth. They find in God a presence that lets them know nothing in life, no matter how unpleasant, will place them outside of God's care and concern. That's what the incarnation is about. When we talk about those fancy words in the 
nicely and crude about the same substance of the Father. What we're really talking about is the way in which God becomes present to us in this life. And sometimes we catch a glimpse of that in those that God has placed around us. And in the very large and the very small actions of those lives that interface with us. I think Bob knew that reality at his core. It oozed out of him. He couldn't help it. It was infused in his being because it was a life marked by drive to serve. If Bob were here, he would say, don't eulogize. I don't like it. Neither do I. But it should be noted that in his life, he served family with love and patience. His love of God and his commitment to study and integrating the faith into life was as constant as a northern star. And one might see that as just seeking achievement. But I think it had more to do with his sense of the incarnation. That God seeks in the most unexpected places and people to be deep within the world and to call us to participate in it and to see it because the flattening of life occludes our vision. Garrett Kaiser, his little book, Watchers in the Night, tells the story of a young woman who was trying to earn a master's degree. It was necessary for her to commute a number of times a week from a little place called Victory, Vermont, which is in the middle of nowhere. I've been there. In fact, you can't, it's not the end of the world, you can see it from there, okay? And she would trans, she would have to, to drive to Burlington to the University of Vermont in order to study over 100 miles away. And she said coming home late at night, she would see an old man sitting by the side of the road. He was always there, whether it was storming, sub-zero, no matter how late she returned. He never acknowledged her, never waved, he just sat there with a cap on his head and his shoulders covered. And she wondered what brought him there. She thought perhaps he was mentally ill and didn't have a place to live. But finally, she asked a neighbor, have you ever seen an old man who sits by the road late at night? The neighbor says, oh yeah, many times. She said, is he a little touched upstairs? Does he ever go home? The neighbor laughed and said, he's no more touched than you or I. And he goes home right after you do. You see, he doesn't like the idea of you driving by yourself out late all alone on those back roads. So every night he walks out to wait for you. And when he sees your taillights disappear around the bend, he knows you're okay. And he goes home to bed. I'm the good shepherd. He knows when we pass the bend. Bob has passed this bend, but he lives with us in wisdom and brilliance and is a sign of the grace of God. Amen. Living and trusting in God, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to determine the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Almighty God, you would knit your chosen people together in one communion, in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. Hear us, Lord. 
Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to newness of life, and that through the grave and gate of death we may pass with him to our joyful resurrection. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith that your Holy Spirit may lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days. Grant to all who mourn sure confidence in your loving care that casting all their sorrow on you, they may know the consolation of your love. Give us, Lord. Give courage and faith to those who are bereaved, that they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a holy and certain hope, and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. Give us, Help us, we pray, in the midst of things we cannot understand, to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. Hear us, Lord. Grant us grace to entrust Bob to your never failing love which sustained him in this life. Receive him into the arms of your mercy and remember him according to the favor you bear for your people. Hear us, Lord. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend you, our brother Robert, who is reborn by water and the Holy Spirit and holy baptism. Grant that his death may recall to us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. Give us, we pray, the faith to so follow where you have led the way and where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit to ages of ages. Amen. Rest eternal, grant him, O Lord, and let the light shine on him. May his soul and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. And of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. This concludes our service. I believe there's a reception waiting. Is that right? So find something to hold for you.